I was in a, a pub a few months ago, and more specifically, I was in a pub toilet a few months ago, standing, emptying my bladder, as you do, <laughs> and the door creaked open and in stumbled a fairly inebriated elderly gent. And he came and stood next to me, unzipped, and he started to do the same thing. And just after a short period of time, he, he leaned over and referring to our two streams of waste, he said, what a waste. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure he was referring to the monies he'd spent on the beers he'd drunk. But perhaps his words were a little bit more accurate than he actually realised. And perhaps this stream of liquid going down the drain was in fact a valuable resource and potentially a rich source of energy. So you probably guessed the answer to that. I, I work in the Bristol Bioenergy Centre. So and what I, what I want you to get by the end of this talk is that perhaps our, our bladders can actually be a storage vessel for a resource that could be used for charging your mobile phones, perhaps lighting in your yard, and maybe even powering robots. And it's not only urine, it's actually wastewater as a whole. It's, it's the, the liquid that you flush from your house, houses down, down into the pipes. It's all a, a potentially a source of energy. So if I just take you back to that urinal in the pub, if you imagine my urine trickling down the pipe, mixing with my, my new drunk friend's urine as it flows down underground and into the, the large underground pipes where there's a whole complex mix of wastewater that's come from our kitchens, bathrooms, toilets. This whole pick-a-mix of organic matter is flowing along there. And it's this energy, the energy is stored in the organic matter. And what I'm going to explain to you a bit later on is that there's a certain wonderful type of bacteria that can help us lock into that energy and so that we can actually use it for our own benefit. So where actually is this wastewater heading? Well, it's heading towards the wastewater treatment plants. And what's going to happen when it gets there? Well, it's going to be treated, cleansed of all this wonderful organic matter that I've just been telling you contains all this energy. So actually, I mean, it, it is an important process. It's, it's very important that we actually clean this waste because of the infrastructure that's set up at the moment, because essentially that wastewater is going to go back into the rivers and into the waterways. And living in those waterways, there's bacteria. So we have to feed untreated, dirty water in there. They would consume this waste. And in doing so, they would consume oxygen, which is in the, in the waters. So the dirtier this waste is, the more oxygen these bacteria consume. And essentially, we'd end up suffocating, killing the fish, the aquatic life, the predators that prey on the fish, and maybe even humans themselves as well, further down the line. So it's very important that we treat this wastewater, and, and the, the, com the treatment companies do a fantastic job. But they're actually under a real lot of pressure to improve uh, both efficiency, and this is almost a yearly, year, year basis, the effici efficiency of treating, but also the, uh, we're doing this at less energy-intensive methods. And so one of, the, one of the ways that they can try and overcome this is to look for new technologies and potentially an, an alternative energy as well, alternative energy techni uh, technologies as well. So I've, I've mentioned that there's this energy stored in the potentially the dirtiness of the water. So rather than using more energy to remove this, why don't we actually use that organic matter in there to create energy? And so how can we do that? Well, it's a technology, uh, it's, in, it's in the microbe, it's a technology called microbial fuel cells. And this is just an example of some of the generic types that have been used down the decades. So what is a, a microbial fuel cell? Well, it's, it's been termed as a biobattery. And a battery is actually not really an accurate term because a battery starts life with a set amount of reactants. Once those reactants are consumed or, 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 or depleted, the battery is dead. You can't use it anymore. A fuel cell, on the other hand, will keep on producing power, providing you keep feeding it fuel. And with a microbial fuel cell, as you may have guessed, this wastewater can be the fuel. And I'm pretty certain we're not gonna, we're not gonna run out of that. So how do these things work? Well, essentially they're, they, they consist of two electrodes, like a, like a battery, a, a negative electrode and a positive electrode. The negative electrode, this is where the bacteria are gonna live. This is where we're gonna feed the fuel and this will essentially be free of oxygen in this, this chamber. And this is separated from the positive electrode, which sits outside in, in air, and the positive electrode, and, this, and there's a separator in the middle, which we call the membrane, or the por porous uh, separator. So at the beginning of a, a microbial fuel cell's life, or I sometimes you can you hear me referring to an MFC, so the beginning of the life, we have what we call the inoculation period. And the inoculation period is where we introduce the bacteria into the anode chamber, 
And the bacteria, that it's a special type that can produce electricity. They've been referred to as a nodophilic or electricogens, or I, my personal favorite is the more powerful sounding, electroactive. So we introduce these into the, in the inoculation period, and these will grow on our electrode surface. And once we have a nice established biofilm in there, we can feed in the, en the, waste, the wastewater or the, the fuel. So once we feed this into the, the chamber, the bacteria, that says this is full of organic matter, the bacteria will consume this or organic matter, and they use it for their own purposes, energy-wise, so for growth and maintenance. But they have byproducts, they have waste products as well. Now, in the presence of oxygen, they would use oxygen to get rid of these waste products, but because there's no oxygen in there, luckily for us, there's a fantastic organism which can, can use the conductive surface of, lo and behold, an electrode. So if, we, if, if these bacteria are dumping their electrons onto our electrode, if we have a, a nice a piece of wire or, or circuit connecting this to our positive electrode, we have e electrons being produced, dumped onto the, the, the electrode, and we can draw this round to the positive ele ele uh, electrode, and we have production of electricity. Now, an important process of this is that the protons, which are also a waste product, are passed through this membrane or porous separator. These join together back with the electrons, and oxygen in air to form small amounts of water. So the really exciting bit about this technology is if you think about what the bacteria are doing, so this is organic matter, it's essentially a pollutant. We don't want it in there. So they are eating more and more of this organic matter. The more orga organic matter they, they eat, the more electrons are produced, and we're getting electricity out. So I think what, what's basically happening is we're cleaning the waste and getting electricity as, as a direct consequence. So it's, it's a really exciting technology, and, and, and the concept is incredible. We get power out from cleaning waste. However, there are limitations to a microbial fuel cell. So for, if you think of the size of a bacterial cell, if you think, and, and the metabolism, they, their, their rate of metabolism is, is limited by bi biologically what they can do. We can't make them go faster than biologically they're able. So these are really low power systems. And so please don't expect to see these on the back of the blue of the bloodhound card cars zooming down the, the raceways. So this, this, this just brings us to the crux of, of this, the technology. Is it just this nice, something you can put up on a graphic which looks nice, cleans waste, produces electricity, and is it essentially going to end up staying in the lab just as a curiosity and not, not kind of being demonstrated outside for a useful purpose? And, and, and so hence, are we then going to have all this valuable resource that's flowing underneath our feet going to waste? Well, I'm going to use a few examples of the research that's come out of our lab and some of the innovation from our lab and our centre to, exp to explain to you how we've moved on and how really quickly the technology has, has come on just in the past few years, and it's really quite exciting times. Now, when I first started, it was about eight years ago, we were working with microbial fuel cells, the, the power output per fuel cell was much lower than it is today. I have a, a poster next to my desk, which I'm very proud of, which shows that the, one of the first experiments I actually ever, I ever did, and there's a, there's a curve on there showing the, the maximum power I was getting out of my fuel, fuel cell at the time. This was eight, eight years ago. And the maximum power was 30 microwatts. Now, to put that into perspective, and I remember being really happy with that, that performance, but to put, put that into perspective or context of what could that actually do, so if I was going to wanted to use these as a power source, for, for example, a rechargeable USB that requires about half a watt USB device, I would have needed over 16,500 of those fuel cells to do that, which clearly is not realistic or viable. You try telling somebody that I'm gonna, you're going to install those into their property, they certainly they just wouldn't have the space. So these were very low power back then, but despite that, there were some really amazing examples of what you could do with this bacterial power uh, to actually for a, for, a, for a useful purpose. And this was in a a series of robots, it was, it was started before I actually even joined, called the EcoBot robots, and, and microbial fuel cell powered robots. And again, these were low power, so don't envisage some space Star Wars-esque BB-8 zooming around the lab. These were, these were low power, and they, ba they worked by energy harvesting. So as the bacteria produced the, this, this, this energy, it was stored in capacitors, and when the capacitors were full, they were discharged, and the, e the robot could then perform a role, and this was either moving towards light or, or sensing the environment or sending data signals. And there's four robots in the series. Uh, the later ones, EcoBot 3 and EcoBot 4, they could do a little bit more. They were more autonomous. 
they could actually move towards food, feed the, feed the bacteria when they needed to, and then even expel their own waste. So these were a wonderful example of kind of what you can do with low amounts of power, but not necessarily the answer to what can we, we can do with all this unlimited resource that's flowing beneath our feet. And there's been a couple of really big developments in the, in the past just three years or so that have really helped push the MSC technology to even more exciting times. And, and one of those is the materials. So the cubic fuel cells I showed you earlier on, these were, based, these were used, the materials were used were were taken really from chemical fuel cells, which are operating in very, very condi different conditions from microbial fuel cells, at very, very high temperatures, conditions that the bacteria would not survive in. And, and then, so the materials that were designed for these, they, they were actually limiting performance. We didn't necessarily know it at the time, but they were holding back performance. So we've started looking at some, some, some more novel materials, and one of the key ones that we found is, is ceramic. It's a fantastic material. So we, the earlier, the, the first figure you see was actually handmade uh, crude looking one, but it was kind of showed that these things work. And we've kind of developed the technology and need to uh, fuel cells. And now we can group these together and really kind of maximize the output. And one of the, the great things about the cerami ceramic as well is that it's very, very cheap, very expensive. So the kind of the old, old school fuel cells using these expensive chemical fuel cell materials cost a lot of money, look at tens of pounds for a single fuel cell. Whereas we can now build one ceramic style microbial fuel cell for just a few pence. And the other kind of big discovery though, that's, that's come back in the last few days that's helped push the technology is that, that there are various other types of, of waste that we can use. And, and the specific one is urine is a fantastic fuel. And it doesn't have to be treated. It can be straight from the body, warm, bubbly, be fed into these fuel cells. The bacteria love it, packed full of nutrients. It's also very, very conductive as well. So it's, it's a really good fuel. And we've, we've kind of shown some good examples of what you can do with the ceramic fuel cells that are fed the urine. One being, we've, uh, in 2013, showed that you could actually charge a mobile phone using ceramic fuel cells with urine as the fuel. Now that was actually done using quite a s one of the old school small mobile phones with the scre small screens, but we've actually, even in the last few years, we've, we've put in fact, last year, we've, we could actually now fully charge a smartphone. And this is because we're, we're on a daily basis where we're actually being able to tweak the, 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 the materials and the configurations and, and improve performance almost on a daily basis. And, We've actually got a ceramic fuel cell in the lab just the last couple of weeks, which is now producing more than four milliwatts uh, per, for a single fuel cell. And to put that into perspective compared to the other fuel cell from a few years ago, if I wanted to power a, you use that particular fuel cell as a power source for a rechargeable USB device, which requires half a watt, I'd need just about 100 of those fuel cells. So if you compare that to the 16,500 of just a few years, it, it shows kind of how far we've come on. And, and even that, it's not beyond the realms of imagination to, to envisage those operating in a toilet, perhaps with a rechargeable socket, using the fuel as, as a power source. It's also the, the cost of the ceramic has, has helped us to start looking to develop the technology for developing countries as well. And one of we've been working with Oxfam, and we've, we've produced a urinal, which is called the P-Powered Urinal, which uh, so it's this, this structure here had m boxes of microbial, microbial fuel cells underneath. And this has been operated on in the UE grounds on campus, and it's been, been going on for about, about a year now, this, this toilet. The microbial fuel cells were able to power the lighting and motion sensors, and this was all, this was all done using student urine. So this, this, to me, is a great example as well. So this is no longer, this is a technology that's no longer stuck in the lab, but it's now that out there in the environment, and it's actually doing a, a job as, as, part of, as part of real life. And we, as an extension of that, we've also had, um, we, we've got a larger fuel cell, you know, a, a urinal, which was operated at the Glastonbury Music Festival last year. And this was uh, in the Stone Circle field, and it was operated, so it was a year, a couple of weeks prior to the, the festival and a couple of weeks after. And it was open 24 hours a day and fueled by festival goers' urine. And again, it operated, st it operated stably over the period of time, powering the lights. And it's quite nice to be a, be an observer in, in uh, Glastonbury, and in, uh, particularly in this stone circle area. So well, I, I, was, I was seeing what was going on, and come night time, it, it was a focal point for all the, the, the kind of revelers and, and people that have, wanted to have a party to come along. And uh, kind of watching some of the actors, I'm fairly confident that it wasn't only alcohol that was being consumed. And I kid you not, I saw a couple who were gazing at the, the sky who generally felt they'd seen a dragon. 
So what I'm trying to say is that the urine that was going in, into that toilet perhaps contained more complex chemical makeup <laughs> than the normal urine. <laughs> but th these, so these have been really been kind of designed to, to, te to try out really in developing countries with the, uh, with the focus on refugee camps and, and rural areas. And we're in the, in the process now of building a couple of um, urinal type, types like this to be tested hopefully this year in a, a couple of developing countries. We're also really um, focusing on, on wastewater treatment as well. So we, we were working with Wessex Water and we we're kind of identifying sites where we can test these, these um, ceramic fuel cells in the line of fire, as it were, to kind of really capture this, this energy that, that's available. And so just, just to finish, so just um, going back to the urinals, what, something I would also really like to do is if I could find that gentleman from the pub toilet that I met, that I told you about at the beginning of my story, I'd like to invite him down to the pea powered toilets. So that when he's actually going for his urine, I'd lean over and I'd say to him, it's okay, it's not going to waste. Thank you very much. Right.